الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أسخ الله تجيب us إيمان توفيق and that he allows us to get closer towards him and that he fills our lives with prosperity and iman we have a new book here which is following on with the previous book same topic talking about our connection to Islamic politics and specifically the treatment that we have uh, and the connection that we have between the subjects, the people in the country, the ulama and the Muslim rulers and governments. And this is a book which is written by an imam from Ahl Sunnah, Imam al shawkani Muhammad ibn Ali ibn Muhammad al shawkani He was one of the ulama and the fuqaha from Yemen. And he's got a book called Ruf al Asatin. So lifting the blame, loosely translated, lifting the blame, lifting any kind of uh, disparagement for the ruling on those who connect themselves or have some kind of relationship with the rulers. And in this book, it's a very short book, but it's very important because as we will see, Ibn Taymin rahimahullah says in more than one place, uh, that this book is, uh, or the point that he mentions inside the book, is relevant until today. So it was written by Imam Shaukhani and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, gave some comments on it. And the book consists of uh, various topics. The first one is cooperating with the oppression of the rulers. What is the ruling on us cooperating with rulers who are oppressive? And this is very important because, as we will see in the book, he will explain that not all forms of cooperation is assisting in the ruler's oppression. That's point number one. So just because the ruler does things that we don't like, or does things that are haram perhaps, just because you work alongside him, or you are generally supportive of him, doesn't mean that you are supporting his oppression. That's point number one. But also point number two, it's very important for us to realize that just because we are cooperating with a ruler or a government, it doesn't necessarily mean that we are happy with the oppression. And that's very, very important because often you will find people saying that Salafis are pro-country X and you will never find them saying anything bad about certain countries, etc. That is not because we are happy with the oppression and the things that they're doing wrong. It's not the reason. And as we saw last week, it's from the Aqeel of Ahl Sunnah that we don't speak out, we don't uh, follow the khawarij in tongue therefore if you've got nothing good to say then be quiet and speaking about the rulers as we will see Imam Shokani mentions uh, is the worst form of ghibah because he's still a Muslim brother and he still enjoys the same rights as another Muslim just because he's in charge and he's in the palace and all of those things it doesn't change the ruling that he is still a Muslim if you met him on the street give him salam if he was in the mosque you pray next to him he fasts he prays he gives a zakat just like any other Muslim Therefore, his honor has the same level of respect and perhaps even more in certain scenarios. I'm not sure going to mention that. So now, the reason why we don't speak out is because there's a hikmah in our aqeelah, in our manhaj, but also we treat them as other fellow Muslims. That's one of the things that he's going to talk about. Another thing that he's going to talk about in the book is, <laughs> this is very important, which is, is it permissible for us to work for a government and a ruler and seek provisions from that ruler and to be part of that government and to gain your risk from working within Islamic politics and as we see today unfortunately and like we said the book is very relevant because this challenges the doubt that some extremists have made and people who follow and sympathize to the extremist view of having scholars for dollars so you have scholars who work with certain governments, etc., and they say he's paid out by the government. That's why he will never say anything bad. So we'll look at that. And that's a very important point, because not everybody who makes that claim is an extremist. It's either the person is an extremist and he knows he's extreme, or he's a person who is ignorant and he doesn't realize that he shouldn't be speaking as a point of aqeel, as we've seen last week, and he shouldn't be revolting and speaking out against the rulers. So he's going to look at that. Also, the book looks at uh, a point which is very important for us to understand also, which is that a lot of people will say, where, is the, where are the ulama? 
Where have they gone? Look what's happening now in this country and that country. Nobody's speaking out. The author's going to challenge this as well and say, is it better for the ulama to get involved or is it better for them to abstain? He's going to discuss that. And another thing, and the last general topic in the book is the author asking if the uh, alim or the scholar seeks to get involved with Islamic politics or with a ruler, etc., can you then blame them for getting involved? And when you put it like that, I think it makes, obvious, it, makes it very, very obvious, but when you go out into the street and when you look at the news, etc., it's not so obvious. If you have an alim, you have a scholar, he's religiously grounded, he's very, very well educated, probably a lot more wiser than us, and we see him with a ruler, etc., is it permissible for us then to start having suspicion about him or ridiculing him or degrading his ijtihad? And this challenges the idea that people are saying that or them are, are puppets of the government or the governments themselves are puppets. And as you can see now in point number two, as we've talked about scholars for dollars, the, these are the two main issues. Where are the ulama? Number one, either he's paid out or either he's a coward. And you will find a lot of them who are extreme or sympathize to extremism. They say the real ulama, all of them are in prison. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense at all. So these are some of the things that we're going to discuss in the book. Now the author begins uh, by having a few pages in talking about, and the very first issue that he wants to bring up is uh, working alongside the, the rulers. What's the ruling in that? And he says in origin, asking others for your provision is disliked. So going to the ruler and asking him to provide for you so that you can do a job for him, etc., is disliked. And in this chapter, as we will see, what he's going to tackle is the idea of scholars for others. So now the author goes on to mention that in its asal, the, the anbiya and the rusul in origin, they sought their own means to gain their own risk. So he gives the example of Musa alayhi salam when he fled from uh, Fir'aun and he settled in Madian for a while. He made tawassul to Allah to give him provisions. Rabbi inni lima anzult min He leant against the tree. He was in a foreign land and he made dua to Allah. He didn't go asking people. He didn't start begging. But the author, and he gives different examples from Ayu and others from the Anbiya, but also the author, the author then goes on to say that, yes, this is how the prophets were. They sought their own risk, they used to make dua to Allah, they used to supplicate, and they used to take their own means. But it is permissible for a person to work under a ruler and to be part of a government. And that doesn't degrade his status in the slightest. And the example that he gives is the example of Yusuf alayhi salam. Now this is very interesting because what they will say is you can be cooperative against, ulam, against rulers, I'm sorry, you can be cooperative alongside rulers who are good, but you cannot be cooperative against rulers who are bad. And then they make it as an issue of aqeedah and they will say no, if you are with a ruler, and we do not like that ruler, then he is Tagut, and you will be following him in that, and you will be Tagut, or you will be a Munafiq, etc. And this is what they say about ulama. But the author is saying here, as proof that you can work for a government, for a ruler, in a halal manner, as long as your role is halal, because Yusuf salam worked as a minister. Did he have, was he working alongside a Muslim ruler? The Aziz at that time, he didn't have the religion of Islam. Therefore, if we were to apply that same logic, then Yusuf salam, would be guilty of committing a major sin at the least. At the least. They would class that as kufr, but at the least. But they will say, no, that's a different sharia. But that doesn't make sense either. Because the ulama of Ahlul Sunnah are in complete consensus. That there's no Nabi and there's no Rasul that will ever fall into Kufr or Shirk. 
or nifaq or major sin. All of them are infallible. And kufr and shirk and nifaq has always been the, the case from the time of Adam. Has it been allowed for us to worship idols in Adam Sharia, but it's haram in our Sharia? It doesn't work like that. Therefore, the author is mentioning a point here, which is that it is in his asal not permissible or makru with the ulama for us to go around asking for, for people, for our risk. You should be seeking your own risk, putting in your own effort, making dua, etc. But is it permissible then for you to actually work and ask the ruler for a role if you, if you are educated enough, if you are suitable? Then the answer is yes. The author then goes on to discuss another point, which is that after establishing this as a ruling in Islam, we will find that the ulama of the salaf were very balanced in the way that they used to interact with rulers. What do we mean by that? What we mean by that, the author is saying here, after the Khulafa al-Rashidun, Islam grew at a very, very strong rate. That meant there were caliphs, and then after caliphs there were kings. After that there was going to be an army, and that army grew also, and it was bulging. And what that also meant is their treasury grew. So now you can see the Islamic politics is growing and growing and growing. And the amount of money and the wealth and it becoming a very strong superpower. And this is all at the time of the Salaf. So they didn't deny that and they didn't reject that and they didn't stop that. They didn't say, well, we need to stop the growth, etc. That's, that's one way that they were balanced. But the, also, the other way is, you will find that the ulama of the Salaf, even the rulers themselves were put in place as rulers quite often. They used to be very, very balanced and very, very reserved in the way that they used to interact with the treasury. And some of them you will find didn't even take any money from the treasury even though they were, had right to it. So the author is making a very important point that as a principle in our adab and our mannerisms and the way of zuhud of the ulama of the salaf is that they didn't stop growth but that growth didn't stop them from forgetting the akhirah. And that's a very important point for us because now you might find an alim, he's working alongside a ruler and he might be a grand mufti of a, of a country or he might be a senior scholar from, and he's working alongside the ruler. Does it necessarily mean that just because he's got wealth and all those things and access to wealth, and wealth that he's attached to it? It doesn't because we've seen that from the ulama of the salaf. They had a lot of wealth, they had a lot of things coming in. But they themselves live very, very simple lives. But the author then goes on to make a point after that, is that as Islam grew, obviously Beit al-Mal grew. And historically, factual, but also in the books of fiqh, that's when qadis started to become employed. Muftis started to become employed. Imams started to become employed. Mujtahids started to become employed. They start studying and teaching. And mujahids also, army and generals and stuff like that, all of these were employed by the ruler. And this is a very important point because we're still on the same topic, which is that if you have a Muslim ruler, you can work for him and you can gain your risk from him and there's nothing haram. In his asal, in his origin, you should be seeking your own. But if there is a role for you, then there is no harm in that. And we have a point historically also is that Umar used to have generals in different places and locations and he would, what he used to do is he used to put somebody in a place and he used to give him a house he used to give him a servant he used to give him an animal and he used to provide for him food daily and he used to say Umar this is because you are too busy to go and work a 9 to 5 you are too busy to go and do something else we need you to concentrate on something which is very important. Don't worry about the money. We'll provide for you your, your expenses. So this is a very important point that the author is making. So just to summarize all of this before we move on to the next point, which is do we then have a relationship with rulers who are oppressive, <laughs> is that Islam, at this point, like we said, is historically and it's factual. You can't change that. This is what happened. But also in the books of Fiqh you'll find it. 
But Islam is very, very balanced between being excessive in materialism and also very, very balanced in being extreme and not seeking the dunya at all. This is the point when we're talking about the topic, but in life in general, this point is, is evidence in itself that we shouldn't become overly attached to the dunya and we become, everything becomes about mal and having the best of clothes and the best of everything for the sake of having a luxurious life, but at the same time that we don't become uh, stingy or live a life of desperation. Because the ulama of the Salaf had access to the life of luxury. And they didn't shun it completely. They used those things for that was going to benefit Islam and the Muslim. And that's what Imam Shokran is saying. But at the same time, for themselves, they took whatever they needed. And even if it was a lot, they were connected to the Akhirah. And they had that level of detachment from the dunya. And they never forgot that. So this far, we have established that it's permissible for us to work with rulers. It's permissible to engage in Islamic politics. Uh, at this point, where we are in the book already, we will also see that Islam had wars and it had expansion and it had an army, etc. And that meant that they needed to have treasury, they needed to have economics, etc. And all of this now so far teaches us that Ahl Sunnah and understanding this, the way we've understood it just now, is the balanced way between the people who are the murji'a and the people who are the khawarij. Now the murji'a, they believe that there is no attachment between a person's Islam and his actions. If you say la ilaha illallah in your heart, that is enough. But we will see now, Islam didn't grow in that way. If that's how Islam was, then Islam would have never grown. It would have just been stunted because we tell people to say la ilaha illallah, that's it, and that's it. Nothing happens beyond that. There is no politics, there is no economics, there is no growth. In order for Islam to be successful, we have to take ownership of our own Iman and make it grow in ourselves, and only then will it then be successful. But this historical point also refutes the Khawarij, and the Khawarij are the extremists, and the extremists say that we need to use violence to establish Islam, and to establish a Sharia, etc. But we can see from all of this so far that Islam is not violent. And quite often lands became Muslim lands just by the Muslims interacting with them and having a good Bayt al-Mal, and showing them the good side of Islam. And it also shows us that the Khawarij, they want to take over whatever they can take over, in any way they can. And we see this in Syria today. There will be a small city, they will overtake that city, they will kill everyone off, and then he will put his flag down and say, I'm the Khalifa, and this becomes our country. This historical point that we've just mentioned here, that Imam Shokani is talking about, shows us that this religion is a religion of organization. But the Khawarij want to understand politics in a way which is not organized. They just want complete chaos and bring about Sharia in any way. If you find a person walking down the street, you can stab them and kill them because you are working towards the Sharia. But that doesn't make sense. Historically, that's never happened before. And what this shows us that not only did they have an organization and a structure, but it also shows us that they never ever took up arms without there being an army, and without there being a ruler, without there being a Beit al-Mal, without there being some kind of organization behind it, financially, tactically, pol politically, etc. And we also see from this factual point, this far also, that you never find revolution taking place for the sake of them removing a ruler because they believe that it was in their aqidah to do so. So that's the first point that the author is mentioning. Then he goes on to mention another point, which is that, okay, what if the ruler is oppressive? Because it could be said that the ruler is oppressive and we do not want to associate ourselves with them. فَإِنْ قُلْتْ قَدْ يَكُونْ مِنَ الْمُلُوكِ مَنْ هُوَ ظَالِمْ جَائِرٌ قُلْتُ نَعَمْ It might be said to you that such and such ruler is an oppressive ruler. Those examples that we've just been talking about, they're pious. They're the imams of the salaf. You can't equate Abu Bakr as Siddiq to somebody today. That doesn't make sense. So Imam Shokani said, yes. However, cooperating in goodness is not like cooperating in evil and oppression. What does that mean? That means is that you might have a ruler today. Obviously, he's not going to be like Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, or Ali. May Allah be pleased with them all. But what it does mean is that the principle has already been set from us, us. It's not your job to find a ruler like Abu Bakr and put him in. 
But if Islamic ruler is there, what do you do? You, you, you are not in charge of making him an Abu Bakr, but what do you do? What's your role? So Imam Shukani is saying here, Rahimahullah, if you cooperate with an oppressive ruler, that doesn't mean you've got anything to do with evil oppression. And that's very, very important because now people will say, you Salafis keep talking about Saudi Arabia and praising Saudi Arabia, it's the land of Tawheed. Or you keep talking about another country or another country. But don't you see the oppression that's going on? Don't you see that there's uh, haram things that are happening? There's banks in there and things like that. That means you guys are agreeing with the oppression. Imam Shawkani has just flawed that. That doesn't make sense. And he goes on to explain why. He says, number one, a person must continue himself if he is able to spread justice and to bring about clarity, then he must do that. And like we mentioned before, the ruler is just another human being. You might have a friend who engages in riba. And there might be a king who allows riba to come in his country. Is there any difference in our approach? Human being, human being. You speak to the brother, Akhi, listen, you need to get rid of that mortgage. Get a house instead, rent, look at other alternatives. It's exactly the same thing. So the alim, Imam al-Shawqan, rahimahullah, is saying here, if you have the ability to change what is haram, and you have the ability to bring about justice, and you have the ability to clarify, then there's nothing wrong with you. In actual fact, as we will see later on, he says it is not just permissible, it might even become wajib upon you, because Allah might question you on the Day of Judgment. 10 million, 20 million, 30 million people, you could have changed their lives. And because you didn't get involved with that ruler, where were you? Imam Shokani he goes on to say, if the oppressive ruler, and this is a very important point, if the ruler is oppressive, the more oppressive he is, and the more you show patience with him, what's going to happen? He might improve, yeah, but what happens to you? You get more reward. So Imam Shokani is switching the idea. He's saying, not only will you still be rewarded for, cry, uh, for trying to make it uh, established, but in actual fact, you will actually be rewarded for struggling against a great deal of hardship that you are facing. May Allah have mercy on our scholars and preserve those who remain. Then he goes on to mention another very important point, is that not all people are the same. And this is very important. Because Ahlul Sunnah don't deny the fact that just because you have a scholar next to an alim, that the scholar is not evil and the ruler is not evil. We can't, we can't deny that. Is that a possibility? Of course it's a possibility. So the Shaykh is saying here, not all people are the same. It is possible that there are evil scholars with evil intentions. But we are talking about those people who want to remain sincere. And that's very important. Because you might find something from a scholar, and it's very, very strange, but he's still a person of high degree and caliber, etc. We just leave him to it, and that's his opinion. You are not in charge of his heart. You are not entrusted to open up and say, Is he got nifaq in there or kufr in there? Why did he say that statement? Is it based on kufr? Is it based on nifaq? Is it based on that he wants to spread oppression? Or is it that he's made a genuine mistake? Are you in charge of that, Imam Shokan? He says, no, Rahimullah. And that makes obvious sense. Rather, he goes on to say that it's our religious obligation to repel the, repel the dhulm, even if it means that you need to get closer to that ruler. And then he goes on and he lists uh, specific rulings. I mean, uh, he gives evidences. The Prophet wasallam said, that you will find that the worst kind of a darkness on the Day of Judgment is dhulm. And he's applying that to those people who are perhaps evil scholars or evil intentions about who are surrounding uh, uh, the ruler. But at the same time, at the same time, the Prophet said in a hadith, which is in uh, Tirmidhi, to uh, Ka'b, Ibn Malik, that Ka'b the Prophet supplicated to Ka'b, I seek refuge in you, I seek refuge in Allah for you, that he protects you from uh, foolish rulers. Meaning in the sense that they perhaps are evil and oppressive. 
So he asked, Wama Imarat Sufaha Rasulullah, who are those foolish rulers? Never heard of that before. So the Prophet وسلم, said, Umara yakunun ibadi. They're going to be rulers that come after me. Wala yahtadun bihadi, and they will not follow my guidance. Wala yastanun bi sunnati, and they will not follow my sunnah. And you will see them because of that spreading a lot of dhulm. فَأُولَٰئِكَ لَيْسُ مِنِّي وَلَسْتُ مِنْهُمْ They have got nothing to do with me and I've got nothing to do with them. Look at this. The Khawarij today, the extremists today, they're holding up the ban of La ilaha illallah. What's going to happen in the The Prophet وسلم, said, I've got nothing to do with them. And they've got nothing to do with me. وَلَا يَرِيدُونَ عَلَىٰ حَوْدِي And when it comes to the pool on the Day of Judgment, when the people of Ahlul Sunnah will be drinking from it, may Allah make us of them, they'll be drinking and they'll be enjoying with the Messenger of Allah وسلم. The Prophet وسلم, said that these people will be barred from having any access and they've got nothing to do with it. But he then says, look, this is the point, that if you find one of those rulers who is oppressive, then do not support them in their oppression but you can still assist them in other affairs they don't uh, support them in their lies and in their oppressions so they are from me and I am from them and I will see them at the hold and in another narration the Prophet ﷺ said, وَلَكِمْ مَنْ رَضِيَ وَتَابِعَ Anybody who then is pleased with that and then follows them in that, those are the ones who will then be siding with themselves in oppression. So Imam Shawkain rahimahullah is using this as actually specific proof to say that it is permissible. He says, ثُمَّ بَيِّنَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمَ لَنَا فِي مُدَاخِتَ الظَّلَمَ مَا هُوَ الْقَوْلُ الْفَصْلُ وَالْحُكْمُ الْعَدْلُ that is permissible based on this for us to get involved with rulers who might be oppressive but you are getting involved with them to clarify you are getting involved with them to spread justice that's very important because that completely eradicates the idea that these ulama are there to cement the throne of tawaghit etc Imam Muhammad bin Salih Uthaymeen rahimahullah makes a comment here and it's a very good point to make a comment on he says what Shokani is saying here is very very good because the Muslim in his life is always a Muslim is a person who brings about and tries to bring about goodness so if he has access to a ruler which millions of people have no access to, but he has access, is he going to shut that door off? This makes sense. Whereas the Muslim, the proper Muslim, he will look at any opportunity that's spreading khair. So if he knows somebody who is oppressive, he will try his breast to bring about goodness from that person. That's one point. Another point that Uthaymi mentions here is that for a person who is able to explain the truth, it becomes wajib for that person to explain the truth. That is an Islamic obligation. You don't even need to be a scholar to do that. If you have a family member who's doing something haram, and you know it is haram, and you know why it is haram, you can't just be quiet without advising them. So he's saying it becomes a religious obligation for us who know the truth, then to explain the truth if you are able to do so. That's another point. And another reason why he is supporting what Imam Shokani is saying here is that he said that there's no doubt that anybody who has ikhlas, and this is a very important point here, anybody who is sincere for the sake of Allah, and he advises another person for the sake of Allah, and so that both of those parties enter into Allah's jannah, Allah will put an impact in that. Allah will put a lot of khair in that. That is the power of ikhlas, that you do something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Nuthaymin rahimahullah is saying here there is no doubt that anybody who says anything or does anything for the sake of Allah to enter into his Jannah and to fear that if he doesn't do it that he could enter into Allah's punishment there is no doubt that somebody who has that level of ikhlas he will have an impact. So that's the second mas'ala. The first mas'ala we looked at is it permissible for us to interact financially with the rulers. The second one okay what if he's oppressive? We've just talked about that. The third issue now, what happens if the people of justice are not involved in politics? 
What happens if the ulama don't get involved? What happens if the people who are uneducated don't get involved? What about if those people who are sincere and want to stop oppression, they don't get involved? Because that's what the extremists want us to do, point number one. And how you know, those people who have some kind of Islamic thought on politics, etc., that's what they say as well. Why are you supporting you know, these puppet governments, and etc.? Imam Ashokani Rahimahullah says that if the ulama are not involved in politics, then there will be a great deal of misguidance and oppression. And history tells us, and he actually lists for about two, three pages exactly what happened in history. And we're just going to summarize it. He said, lands have been exploited. People have been killed senselessly. Because you've got an oppressive ruler, nobody's stopping him. What happens? You can see it until today. Women have become widows, children have become orphans, and places of worship have become destroyed, property has been taken unjustly, and he goes on and he goes on. The point is, there will be a great deal of corruption and oppression if the people of justice do not get involved. But now, Ibn Thaymin, rahimahullah, mentions that there are two types of people who get involved with politics. The first one, is somebody who might be sincere, he's might, he might want to spread some kind of justice, but he has no ilm. And he has no understanding of the religion. And this is very important because you find a lot of people engaging with what they think is happening around the world, but it's not based on Islamic knowledge. It's only what they see in the news. And you can't base something what you've seen on the news because it's, it might not be a true representation. Especially the fact that you don't have an Islamic, because now people will speak against the rulers all the time. When they have seen here that there's Ijma, that you're not allowed to do that. If he's Muslim, then you can't do that. So the Shaykh is saying here, no ilm. No understanding of the religion. He might be sincere, but they might not be educated enough. And what happens as a consequence of that, they don't know what is good and what is bad. They can't decipher between the greater good and the less of the harms. Muthaymin rahimahullah, this is what Shulkani said, Muthaymin rahimahullah said that this brings about oppression because that person is looking at things unjustly. And if you get engaged in things unjustly without being the correct person to do it, you haven't got the ilm, you haven't got the wisdom, you haven't got the perfect know-how, you haven't got the experience, then you will end up oppressing and dealing with people unjustly even if you don't intend to. Perhaps they do intend to, we don't know. So that's the first category of people. The second category of people are those people who do have knowledge, but they are selfish. So Shulkani gives an example, those people who are educated, but they only get involved with politics for their own interests. To become wealthy, to gain power, to become famous, to become close to the ruler, and he gives examples of, extensive examples of that as well, of what's happened in history. So now, for example, he says, what happens now if a person's pretending to be pious? And he's trying to get to the ruler only. That's all that is. What happens? It's shirk. It's a form of riyah, as he's saying. Riyah. Ghiba. Ghiba al-Muharrama. Bighayri sabab wa bighayri haqq. They end up speaking about people. And he says, akl suht They start taking wealth, which doesn't belong to them, but they are taking it unjustly. Because they are saying that they are doing something religiously and they are putting it in their pocket but they are not actually doing that thing which is supposed to be done. There could be an element of nifaq in that also. So now this is a very important point because Ahlul Sunnah don't deny the fact that there could be people who are rulers who are monafiq. They are probably kuffar. They are probably scholars who are around them who appear as scholars and they are probably monafiq. But is that our job? No. What's our job in Ahlul Sunnah? What's our aqeedah? Don't say anything. Make dua. If you can give some kind of nasiha, if you can, then do that. If you can't, then don't get involved. That is the safest way, and that is a matter of aqeer, as we have seen. Imam Shukani, rahimahullah, then goes on to say, but this is wrong to generalize, and it's very important that some scholars who are blamed are blamed unjustly. So now this is the third category. The first category, he doesn't have any knowledge, and he gets involved. The second category, he appears to be a person who is very, very experienced. Maybe he's a religious scholar, maybe he's a politician, but he's getting involved for the wrong reasons. That is haram. 
But now you've got another category of people. Now this is challenging the idea of scholars for dollars and cementing the throat of dictators, etc. Is that they have knowledge and they are sincere. What do we say about them? Do we say to them, do not get involved with politics? Imam al-Shurkani, rahimahullah, is saying perhaps these people are close to the ruler. And if they keep that connection and they keep advising, they can bring about a great deal of goodness. And this is the truth. And we have to look at it being fair and being just. Ibn Uthaymi, rahimahullah, summarizes. He said, sitting and mixing with the ruler is of three groups. Number one, those who are good and they try their best to have a positive impact in joining good, for being evil, all of those things, those people are doing something which is wajib or permissible at the least. The second category are those people who mix and have a negative impact. They actually assist in the oppression. And he might appear to be a scholar or he might be, appear to be a sincere politician but he's actually assisting in that oppression and that is haram. There's no doubt about that. But then we have the third category of people. Sometimes he's in group one, sometimes he's in group two. And also that is not allowed. Now here is a very important point for us to pause on. This is slightly away from the book. The Prophet ﷺ said, Woman ata abwaab salatin iftatin. Anybody who approaches the doors of the scholars, he will be tested in the fitna himself. Anybody who gets closer towards the rulers and governments and politics, except that he gets further away from Allah. This is a hadith which is sahih from the Prophet. So, what we learn from this hadith is that a person shouldn't really get closer to the rulers, he shouldn't get closer involved in Islamic politics, etc., on the face of it. And the majority of the ulama from the salaf stayed away from politics, they stayed away from fitna and rulers, etc. However, we find from the ulama of the Salaf, some of them sitting with the rulers. Imam Malik was asked, إِنَّكَ تَدْخُلْ عَلَى السُّلْطَانِ وَهُمْ يَظْلِمُونَ You, Imam Malik, are sitting with a scholar and he's oppressive. Imam Malik said, يَرْحَمُكُ اللَّهُ May Allah have mercy on you. فَأَيْنَ الْمُكَلِّمْ بِالْحَقِّ Who is the person who's going to speak the truth to him then. Where does he go? Where's his place? So as we can see here that the salaf of this ummah, they said in origin you shouldn't seek to get involved in all those things. And that's very important for us. You put on the news, it says something about this particular ruler. Don't get involved. Allah It's the best thing. Because that's what the salaf did. However, if there is a maslaha, if there is a point where you can actually benefit Islam benefit the ruler or stop any kind of hardship or evil doing in that scenario it becomes permissible for us to then get involved with the rulers and there are many examples for example Urwa the student Aisha anha, he used to mix with Umar bin Abdul Aziz and Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, said that this is proof that the scholars should mix with the rulers and there are people who are claiming that it's against the sunnah but it's not entirely against the sunnah that's the statement of Ibn Hajar Imam al-Zuhri he used to sit with Umar bin Abdulaziz as well and Umar bin Abdulaziz commanded him, Imam al-Zuhri Ibn Shaban al-Zuhri to compile the sunnah he gave him that idea and then Umar bin Abdulaziz got an idea with another scholar that was close to him and his name was Rama Hurmazi and he was the first person to ever write the sciences of hadith Mustala hadith how did that come about? that came about because people were close to the rulers then Zuhri, Zuhri he was an imam of the Salaf, but he had a very close connection with rulers and he was heavily involved with politics. He, after Ibn Umar bin Abdul Aziz, had a close relationship with the next caliph, or the caliph that came after, Suleiman ibn Abdul Malik al Marwan. And he helped him with a lot of decisions also. Now, there was an imam from the Salaf, his name was Makhul. And uh, I believe Zahabi and others from the ulama have said that he was the most knowledgeable person that came out of Sham. Makhul. Makhul said about Zuhri, Zuhri was a great man, but he spoiled himself in ruling, in mixing with the rulers. Imam al Zahabi, and this is very important, the reason why I mention this is because they will quote things like that. 
Don't mix with the rulers, the oppressive, etc. Imam al Dhahabi, and this showing us our understanding, he said that if Zuhri didn't mix with the rulers, then the hujjah and the proof would not be placed upon them. So Imam al Zuhri, uh, Imam al Dhahabi actually says, Where are the likes of Zuhri today? What's he saying? If you can get closer towards the ruler, if he's good, then you're actually helping in goodness. If he needs oppressors, you're putting a stop towards his oppression. So that's some proof from the, kita- from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and giving us the correct understanding and some practical and factual examples from the Imams of the Salaf. But we also have a book which is uh, written by, uh, as an explanation of. Uh, Jami Tirmidhi, which is called Tufat al Ahwadi. And the introduction of there is very inter- inter- interesting, where he actually basically talks about how politics has helped the spread of the Sunnah. Imam Bukhari, Sun uh, Jami, Sahih, Muslims, Sahih, Tirmidhi, and all these other books of the, of the, the Qutb al Sitta. A lot of them actually spread because of the connection between the author or the people who gave that book to a ruler and the ruler liked it and then it had an influence. And this is well known in the books of fiqh, this is well known. The Hanafi Madhab has become the biggest Madhab in the world. Why? Because the Caliphs established it and they made it binding on all the courts to go by the rulings of Abu Yusuf and Muhammad ibn Hassan. And the same thing in North Africa, Maliki Madhab, until today, had a huge influence because of the politics there in Andalus, etc. But the books of Sunnah, particularly, as it says in the introduction of uh, Tafatullah Ahwadi, he says that the books of Sunnah were influenced by politics and society. So Imam Malik ordered his book according to the books of Fiqh, and then it got spread around the whole Muslim Ummah, because of the way that the, the, the politics had been involved. Remember, we just looked at Imam Malik, he was close to the rulers, some of them. Imam Bukhari had narrations from Hijaz and Sham and Iraq and different areas, and that's how it helped him spread his sunnah, his jami'ah. Another one of the Imams of the Salaf, his name is Abu Aswad al-Du'ali, he said, Al-Muluk Hukam al-Nas, the ruler, he is the ruler of the country, wal ulama, the scholars, hukam al muluk, they are the rulers over the rulers. So all of this shows us the understanding of the salaf is that if you can, you shouldn't get involved. Keep yourself away from fitna. As the Prophet said, man sultan Anybody who goes to the doors, then you don't want to put yourself in that fitna. However, if you are able to bring about goodness and to stop haram, then it is upon that alim to get involved. That's the next section. The next section the author goes on to. What is the role of a ruler? What does he do? What are the responsibilities in Islamic politics? Now, he goes on and he lists them, and I don't want to go through all of them, but we can just generalize. Ibn al-Qaim in a separate book, he says, the purpose of Islamic politics is to bring about betterment for everyone. Everyone. Bring about ease, bring about goodness. And if we look at it like that, we have helping the poor and establishing services which should help the poor and the needy. So it's the ruler's role to put a healthcare system down, to put an education system down, put a, put a Beit al-Mal system down, very similar to what we have here. Right. Another thing that the ruler must do is put a stop to injustices and make sure that he is policing that. And this could be internal in his own country and it could be external outside. So he might have you know, international policies also. Another role of the ruler is that he must have a judiciary system where you have prescribed punishments and this is a betterment for everyone. Because then the criminal doesn't go to prison for two months and three months and comes out and then re-offends. And he actually goes on a holiday and this is how they see it. People actually get punished for the thing that they have done, or it works as a deterrent. Umar bin Abdul Aziz said, Rahimullah, this is a very important statement. He said, Inna Allah layaza'a bis sultan ma la yaza'a min al-Qur'an. 
Allah can bring about goodness and remove oppression from a ruler in Allah Sultan Quran he can bring about goodness and remove oppression from a ruler that the Quran itself will not do the Quran itself will not do what does that mean Imam Shawkani explains that statement of Umar bin Abdul Aziz he said was well, he spoke the truth فما قاله هو الحق الذي يعلمه كل العقل every single aql and intellect understands this you have a book here and everybody has a book like this in their home but there's still music in the house. There's still sins in the house. Why? Umar bin Abdul Aziz said, and this is the explanation that Imam Shokani says, if you give people a book to read, maybe they'll follow it, maybe they won't follow it. But if you make it law, and you have an upright ruler, and he's establishing the haq, then people will be encouraged and perhaps even forced to live an upright and respectful life. And in that scenario, criminality will go down, people will be giving each other their rights, people will be giving each other honor, and nobody will be taking each other's wealth out of, uh, without any unjust reason, etc. And he gives different examples of that. He then goes on to make another point, and this is a side point really, it's not connected to any of the other arguments that we mentioned, which is that it's very important for us to realize that the rulers will always be criticized. And this is a very interesting statement. The rulers will always be criticized. Why? Their good deeds are hidden. You'll never see them praying five times a day. You'll never be televised. Yeah, he's praying again. He's praying to Hajjud now. He's fasting today. He's breaking his fast. He's giving him sadaqah to this person. Because us naturally, humans, Muslims especially, we don't want to televise and broadcast our good deeds. Imam Shokani is saying that a lot of people don't realize this. And they make a mistake in speaking against the rulers when they don't weigh up the good and the bad. But can you do that? You don't, because you don't know him. The ruler's good deeds are often hidden, but his criticisms are public and they become scrutinized. So what he is saying here, his advice, is that if a person is involved in government and he's able to have a positive influence, then there is no doubt, and he's saying here on page 22, at the bottom, وَعَلَى كُلِّ هَالِ And he's concluding this point, that if a person is able to bring about goodness, then بَلْ قَدْ تَكُونَ فِي بَعْدِهَا حَسَنَا وَبَعْدِهَا جَوْرَا That the ruler is sometimes in good and sometimes is bad. There is no doubt. لَا يَتَرَدَّدْ أَحَدٌ فِي جَوَازِهَا There is no doubt at all. That that person, if he's able to bring about goodness and he's not going to cooperate in his sin, then it is permissible. Bal, he said, Qad takun wajiba. Rather, it could actually become wajib upon him. Right. Then he goes on to talk about oppressive rulers. And he says, no doubt, if the school, scholars don't get involved with these oppressive rulers, there will be more oppression to the Muslim masses. And Muthaymin Rahimahullah, and he gives evidences of how we should remain patient, etc. Summer wa ta'a, etc. When darba, dahrba, akhada mali, even if he beats your back and takes your wealth, etc. All of these different narrations that we looked at before. This now issue is talking about, as we mentioned in the introduction, can you blame a scholar for getting involved if he thinks it's the right thing to do? And the answer is clearly no. Ibn Muthaymin Rahimahullah said, the scholar makes ijtihad for himself whether he wants to get involved or not. And if he decides that he doesn't want to get involved, then that decision is either, either based on him thinking that there is a greater good in not getting involved, or the lesser of the two evils. But if a scholar thinks that he wants to get involved and he may have an influence, a good influence, then he should do so. There's a statement here that I've managed to find from uh, Sahih Muslim, the explanation of Sahih Muslim by Imam Nawi. He quotes Qadi, Al-Ayyad, Rahimahullah, and he says, If the Imam falls into kufr, or changes the Sharia, or introduces innovations, then he has lost the right to rule, and we don't need to obey him anymore. And this is the issue of Ahl-Sunnah. 
But now he's actually explaining to us what are those conditions when it would be that a ruler would then be replaced. Uthaymeen, rahimahullah, was asked, is it permissible for us then to work for an oppressive ruler? Or is it better for us to leave it? What do you think our ishtihad should be? Because this is the point that we're talking about. He said, first point, if he is the only one that can do a job, or he's the best one that can do the job, then he must remain. So if there's not enough qadis, if there's not enough imams or something, then he must remain in that role. Because the Prophet ﷺ told us, do not leave the ruler unless if you see kufran buah. A clear kufr. And if you've not seen any clear kufr and he's just being oppressive, then continue with him. And if we were to make it a condition that every single ruler must be pious, then finding an upright ruler will never be achieved. So be patient. That's point number one. Point number two, even if we see sins from that ruler, even if you see kufr from that ruler, you need to clarify and discuss and advise. Because what might be clear kufr and a sin from you might not be kufr or a sin from him. He might not understand. So that's the second point. And the third point, and this is why I was mentioning what Qadi said, Rahimullah. It is not permissible for us to make khuruj against a ruler, to revolt and to reject, etc., against a ruler. Unless if there are three conditions. Number one, he is doing something really, really oppressive and it's affecting everyone. Number two, you have the ability to remove him. And number three, you have to look at the long-term effects. If you were to remove him and you've got the ability, have you got somebody you can put in place that is going to be good or better? Have you got an alternative? And this is the statement of Qadi. So if the imam falls into kufr or innovations or something like that, we don't need to obey him anymore. It is then obligatory upon the Muslims to, re- to remove this imam from his position, as in the ruler. And if the Muslim community are not able to do this, then the obligation to remove this type of ruler falls onto those people who are able. However, it is not obligatory to remove an innovator unless they feel that they are able to do so. And that's a very important point. Because here now we are talking about does the scholar get involved or not? What's the correct ishtihad? Now in Muthaymin, Rahimahullah says, no, if he's the only one, then he must. That's why there's no alternative. Point number two, you might have these ulama and you have a ruler they need to stay next to him so they can continue clarifying because he might be making genuine mistakes but we look at it as kufr and sin but it might be genuine mistakes. And point number three, it could be that those rulers need to stay there close to that ruler so that if there is an opportunity for us to continue advising then we can do so. If not, if an alternative does come about and they're the ones who are able to make that decision then they can bring that about. And that's very important. That keeps our aqeedah and that keeps harmony the next issue he goes on to talk about now is does Islam recognize kingships and this is important because a lot of people today are using the idea that these kings are not kings and they're dictators and things like that I mean, they don't recognize caliphs and they don't recognize Islamic rulers and all of these texts that we've been talking about they're talking about rulers, caliphs but not kings the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam actually said in a hadith that al khulafa ba'di thalathuna am that there's going to be thirty years of caliphs. Thumma takunu mulukun aduda. After that, there's going to be a succession of just kings. So the author is using this as proof to say that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has already told us that the caliphs are going to leave. Therefore, does that mean the ruling now changes? The answer is no. The ruler is the ruler. Call him a king, call him a president, call him a prime minister, call him whatever you want. He is the Muslim ruler. That's point number one. Where do we understand that from also? Umar bin Abdul Aziz. He was one of the imams of the Salaf. And in his time, there were no more caliphs. There were no more qualifiers. There were all kings from the Umayyad. And he didn't deny any of them. He didn't deny working with any of them. 
and he didn't deny any of them of their stature. Ibn Uthaymin rahimahullah said that this is proof that the caliphate will turn into kingship. But people will always criticize the word king, but that doesn't change anything in reality when it comes to our Islamic stance. Because the, te- the texts remain in place. But even historically, was there ever a time that Abu Bakr was never criticized? Umar was never criticized, Uthman and Ali were never criticized. Even when we had Khulafa, they were criticized. Therefore, if you call him a king, and you change his title to Khalif, does that change anything? No, because people will still continue to criticize. And he said, even greater than that, the Prophet ﷺ himself was criticized by Dhu Khwaisra. He came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Eidel ya Muhammad, be just ya Muhammad. And he criticized the Prophet ﷺ. Therefore, this point, just summarize this point, which is that you can have kings, you can have alternative rulers, so to speak, but that keeps in line with us obeying them. And the manhaj and the aqeedah of Ahlul Sunnah. Then he moves on to the second from last point, is that how does khuruj come about? And this is very important. Imam al-Shulkani says, Rahimahullah, rulers are subject to bad thoughts. It starts off with suspicion. Then it leads to ghibah and then it leads to buhtan. Ghibah is basically when you backbite someone but it's true. You expose his sins but it's true. Buhtan is worse than that when you make lies against that ruler. Ah, he did this for that reason and you create conspiracies and all those different things and it's not true. He's only doing it because he wants to please another person or please a different government. That's all buhtan if it's not true. And if it is true, then it's ghib. Imam al says that the rulers are always subject to that. Some of it is because a person's aqidah is in his aqidah, because he's a khariji, he's an extremist. He wants to do it because of matter of aqidah. And others because they have left the religion and Muhammadiyah. They have left the correct aqidah and the correct manhaj, which is the way of Ahl sunnah and sometimes what they will do is they will adopt even more extremes to get their point across. And what that means is that they will start becoming violent, they will start exaggerating falsehood and their lies, etc. And Ruthaymin says in explaining this that Imam Shokani's words are so clear and they are so relevant until today. And it can be applied even though he said it two, three hundred years ago, it can be applied until today. He says every single sin, we're not even talking about politics anymore. Every single sin starts with an idea that starts staring from shaitan. Then it becomes legitimized in that person's brain. Yeah, that's a good idea. And he starts thinking about it. He's like, yeah, it's appealing to me now. Then he starts thinking about it and talking about it. Until he acts upon it. And he gives an example. Zina. What happens with zina? You look. You think. You look. You think, then you talk, and then you look more, and then what happens? Allah protect us. So this is the same thing with khuruj. This is what I mean, saying this is sins in general, but the same thing when it comes to revolting and becoming extreme. You start thinking. Hatred, envy, jealousy starts building up until there is a calamity. (coughs) The last point in the book. So what do the ulama, what is their role with the rulers? He said, number one, they need to stay close to those rulers. And what this means is, is that they continue to have a presence and they continue to advise and they continue to warn. Imam al he said, Rahimahullah, that the rulers can sometimes lift up a sword, and he's using this as, you know, as a metaphor, but this has happened in history. They will lift up a sword in order to strike a group of people. And as they lift up their sword, there comes an alim, and the alim able to speak it down to him. Talk him down and say, listen, put that sword down, what you're doing is wrong. What does that alim do against the oppressive ruler? He stops the oppression and the injustice from occurring. And this is the parable, the example that Imam Shokani is saying. Ruthaymi rahimahullah said that the scholars know, and it could be that this particular scholar knows the ruler better than anybody. So he can give him that advice. He can make du'a for him. And I remember also one time on the radio in Saudi Arabia, somebody rang up and the Mufti was, the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia, he had a live call-in, fatwa, Q&A. So 
somebody rings in and he starts criticizing the Mufti. Mufti didn't get angry or anything. I was thought that, you know, this is going to be a bit controversial. You're doing this and you're doing that and you're being quiet. When are you going to start speaking up? They're locking everyone up. They're doing this and doing that. The Mufti says, just one line, so simple. He said, yeah, Akhi. If you don't want us to sit next to the ruler and you don't like what he is doing, who's going to sit there then? Who's going to sit there? Somebody worse than us. If there's somebody better, then tell him to come and he can advise him and bring about that change. But we've known this king for 20, 30, 40 years. We've known the family since they married into the family. So if we're not going to sit there, who's going to sit there? We've seen examples of that in the dars already from uh, Malik and Zuhri, etc. So the author is now saying here, what, do the, what is the role of the ulama? The role of the ulama is that they stay close. They keep the ear. They make the dua. They remain sincere. Because the ulama are the most sincerest and the closest of people. It's not to deny the fact that there might be people who are not, but we don't have bad thoughts about people. We don't want to do that. But being realistic, it could be possible. That there are people who have studied knowledge, but they've got an agenda, and Allah knows best about that. But all of them, Allah has placed the religion upon these people and they've got nifaq in them. That doesn't make sense. Imam Shokani then says, when this is clear, then it becomes evident to us that being close to the ruler, even if he's oppressive, if he's oppressive even more so, like he said, becomes one of the best deeds that a person can do. Becomes one of the best deeds that a person can do. And he says, Rahimahullah, فَهَلْ مِثْلْ هَذَا حَقِيقٍ مِنْ إِبَادَ اللَّهِ الصَّالِحِينَ Is there anyone that is comparable to a person who is close to the ruler and he advises him and he removes the bread? Is there anybody in parallel to that? Because now if you think about it, you have one scholar sitting next to the ruler and the country has 30 million people, 40 million people and he's advising that ruler all the time. What's the ratio? 1 to 40 million. And if that suggestion is good with ikhlas and it's powerful and it makes dua, how much ajr is he going to get? Imam al-Shawkani says, Is there any? فَهَلْ مَثْلْ هَذَا حَقِيقٍ فَهَلْ مِثْلْ هَذَا الْحَقِيقٍ مِنِ بَعْدِ الصَّالِحِينَ Is there anyone that is comparable to that? Imam al-Shawkani, uh, before he concludes, he says, putting blame and creating a block against the rulers is wrong, it's negative, it could even be from shaitan. Rather, the ulama are the people who are sincere and they're educated. And they are the people who are of goodness in themselves, in their own lives. And they want to spread the goodness. And sometimes they need to do this by getting involved with the ulama, uh, with the rulers. But negativity comes from shaitan. And shaitan will make it fair seeming to people that this person is not the person of goodness. So in conclusion, we can say, and this is the last point, Imam Shaukani says, the oppression of backbiting, the honor of people, and this is a very important point. He says, in my opinion, that the, the or with jumla, for in, inni adun, in general, I think, and the dhalama fil a'rad, that if a person is oppressive to another person by taking his possessions, Ajarru min al-dhalama fil amwal is actually worse. Sorry, the other way. The person who is oppressive against the honor of another person is worse than him taking his possessions. The oppression that a person has against the honor of another person is worse than taking his physical possessions. So the oppression that a person puts against a scholar or a ruler or a whole country or the whole government that is far worse than him actually going into that country and probably even taking their possessions. Why? He says, because oppression in wealth is often connected to living and the person wanting to have that wealth for himself. And he wants it to remain alive. And sometimes when a person takes something unjustly, sometimes sometimes good can come out of it as well. It's possible that he might think, oh, stuff, what have I done? I can't find that person anymore. And he gives it in sadaqah. Or he takes something oppressively from somebody else, may Allah protect us, he's got one million pounds that belongs to somebody else, he's ripped another person off, but at least now he's looking after his family and the children are you know, having some kind of a comfortable life, etc. Not justifying it, but I'm trying to say, at least some good has come to someone from all of that. 
But he's saying here from his opinion, and this is his own kind of ishtihad. When you take the honor of another person, that only brings about destruction and loss. There is no goodness. When you speak about the ruler, when you speak about the alim, is there any khair? The only khair that you get out of is your own self-satisfaction. That Yes, I've said something about that person. But have you changed anything? Have you brought about anything? In actual fact, he's saying here, rahimahullah, you've actually spread khaybah wal khusran. You've actually brought about more destruction and loss. Because you're staring. And that's creating more enmity, that's creating more disunity, that's creating less Islam. So in summary, in this book, as you can see, the book is very, very good, it's very, very detailed. We've just overlooked it, to be honest. Uh, in today's session, we've looked at the ruling on cooperating with rulers, whether they're oppressive or not. And we've said that it could be guess, wajib, it might be haram, and it might be in between, and it depends on the outcomes. And that's down to the mujtahid to discover and decide for himself. We've also looked at working alongside the government and taking money from them, and there is nothing wrong with that, inshallah, if the person is sincere and he's doing his role correctly, and you cannot label that person as being a scholar for a dollar or anything like that. And you cannot claim that the ulama are cowards, or that they are puppets, or that the ruler himself is a coward or a puppet, because all of this goes down to ijtihad. And when there is ijtihad involved, as we have seen in the previous books that we have, uh, discussed, it is not permissible for a person to then disrespect that ishtihad. And you must respect it and you must talk to people in a respectable manner, even if you disagree with it. I ask Allah to give us iman and tawfiq and that he rectifies the state of this ummah and he allows us to get closer to him and that he keeps us united and restores the honor of the ummah. هذا والله أعلم وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين.